So uh, what we're dealing with are four problems in metrical form. Uh, the one on top here is what we talked about yesterday, which is how do you assign stress or how do you, what's linguistic accent or prominence or even beat, what's all that about? The second one is uh, what uh, Nigel and Kristen were just talking about, the prosodic form problem, specifically what's uh, the, uh, if you have a poetic meter, what conditions are imposed on a sequence of syllables such that the, the sequence can be construed as members of the class M, meaning the meter. Uh, the third is mostly what I'm going to be talking about, the text setting problem, which Francois also talked about, which is if you have a se sequence of syllables and a tune, usually a strophic tune or song, as Francois mentioned, uh, what assignments of the syllables to the notes in the tune will give you an acceptable text setting. Uh, and then there's a fourth problem I'm just going to mention here, which nobody has, but which is relevant to this discussion, which is the so-called beat induction problem. And that is that if you're just given a series of taps or a bunch of notes, like people have you pretty good intuitions about where the beats should go. So if I were to ask all of you to clap at the appropriate times, it's likely we would more or less agree on where those times should be. Um, now, whether there are any connections between any of these problems is up for grabs. I personally think there are a lot, and I'm going to push between a connection between uh, one and two. Uh, obviously, the field of generative metrics has derived from the connection between one and two. I think there's something to be said about the connection between one and four, but uh, that's very speculative, and I hope somebody else who knows better than I do will pursue it someday. But So I'm mainly I'm going to talk about the connect connections between the prosodic form problem and the text setting problem. Um, so here's how I think it should be, or a reasonable way of laying it out. You have a line on the left, you have some kind of metrical paradigm on the right, and then you have some principles which will allow you to evaluate whether the assignment is correct or not. And if the assignment is correct, you either get an output or you don't. So you either get an ametrical line, in which case you don't get an output or you get a metrical line, you get an output. The text setting problem, you can look at more or less the same way. You have a sequence of syllables, and then you have some, uh, oh, sorry, I you want to look at a specific instantiation of the, of the um, uh, prosodic form problem, which is, I'll go back to 1971, to what Morris and Jay were doing back then, uh, and here's how they represented the iambic pentameter, which is this alternating sequence of weak and strong positions, some of which are parenthesized, and then they have those two X's on the end, and I'm going to return to those in a second. Uh, but then based on those, that paradigm, then you establish some kind of comparison between the two, and again, if it works, you get a metrical line, and if it doesn't, then you uh, get any metrical line, you throw it out. Um, the most probably uh, determinative principle is the stress maximum principle, which we all know about, which I'll return to in a second. Um, okay, well, here's the text setting problem in English. You have a tune like da 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 da, right? Ode to joy, everybody knows. And then you have a tune on the, you have eight syllables on the left. One is tell me not in mournful numbers, yeah. And then the other is Rudolph the reindeer, Re Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer had. And it would be pretty tough for most people to sing B to the tune, whereas most people would find it a pretty easy matter to sing A. So our intuitions, at least in this case, are pretty robust. So we're you know, able to do what Mark calls uh, armchair linguistics, I think, in this circumstance and consult our own intuitions to get the right answer. So that's the uh, uh, one form of the text setting problem. The one that most that uh, Francois mentioned previously and what Weardell's in my paper was is on the a particular variant of it, which is the strophic text setting problem, which is you have a sequence of syllables which changes and then you have a strophic tune which gets repeated again and again and again. And then the qu interesting question is, how does the tune change when the text changes, right? So, and that you know that happens, and here's the indication that it happens. You have the tune, what shall we do with a drunken sailor, on the original, and then in subsequent verses, you'll have one that goes, he'll haul him till he's sober, where you have seven syllables, which means you have to dump three of the notes from the original, yeah? And then you have a subsequent one where you have put him in the scuppers with a whole stove pipe on him, where you have 11, and now you have to find some other location for the 11th syllable. And everybody knows how you do it. You go, what shall we do with a drunken sail? You know, he'll haul him till he's sober. And you go, put him in the scuppers with a hose pipe on him. And what you see at the bottom there is what I claim to be a representation of what it is that you do. So you have a sequence of positions on the bottom assigned to each of the grid positions. 
some of which are optional and some of which are mandatory. And I'm going to indicate the mandatories either by one, if it's a note that's in the original that has to stay in all possible variants, and I'm going to uh, uh, indicate the mandatory vacancies by that null sign. And that means that's a position which you can never occupy. Okay, and uh, we don't have a case of that here, but you'll, I'll, I'll have one later. Um, and so what that means is that all of that, when you say uh, drop out the uh, second, third, uh, second, third, and fourth syllable in keel, haul him till he's sober, that's uh, an indication of these the, the minus signs there in the grid that are in the uh, fourth and fifth positions indicate that you can do that. The plus position prior to that means it's a position in the original that's not available to you, that's available to you to insert something if you need it, okay? And that's why you can go put him in the scuppers and the, so in the, in the, with the hose pipe on him. So that position is available to, for you to occupy. So with that in mind, you know, we all, we do, all this, do this completely naturally when we hear strophic songs and we sing strophic songs. The question is, is there a comparison to be made with uh, poetic meter? And here's one, okay? So look at Morris's and Jay's paradigm from 1971 and what are the parenthesized positions? Well, they tell you what are the positions that are possibly occupied, what, what are the positions that can possibly be occupied but, or left out in attested variants. So we're going to assume that something like the curfew tolls and Ella parting day is the unmarked, unproblematic case. And then you have the first, the, so then, but then you also have lines like to be or not, not to be, that is the question, so with a so-called feminine ending. And that means that that exposition there is occupied. It's there for you to, if you, if you need it, and it is for that line. And then there's another one with a so-called double feminine ending, whatever ails me now, late especially, that occupies both. And then you have the so-called uh, headless I am, which I guess you get in Chaucer fairly commonly, and that is, this is from Chaucer, a 20 book is clad in black and white, and that's where you leave out the first position that is optionally vacant, okay? So there's one nice connection between text setting and poetic meter. You have this phenomena of occupied, of, of optional positions, okay? So that's one. Now I'll give you a second one. Um, uh, so there are certain assignments of positions to, uh, 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 of syllable types to positions that are problematic. And as I mentioned before, in uh, Morris's system, uh, you, uh, the, 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 circa 1971, it was the so-called stress maximum that dictated what the problematic align, align, alignments were. And we, they uh, seem to explain some reasonable fraction of the corpus. I'm not going to put too much stock in them empirically, but because my focus here is on their function and test setting. And here's a nice example. So go back to our tune that you had before. Tell me not in mournful numbers and try, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. So what is the problematic location? Dreaming, okay? According to Morris's definition, a stress syllable adjacent to two unstressed syllables in a, its own syntactic constituent, there's a stress maximum, so you could, let's say, make the print, make, uh, 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 advance the principle that you don't want to have stress maximums in metrically weak positions. And it seems to do a certain amount of work. Let's look at another one that we saw before, by the dawn's early light, same deal, right? Stress maximum, now it's in a triple meter, but the second position we're gonna assume <laughs> Pache, Kirsten, that it's weak, and that therefore the stress maximum doesn't allow you to do it, and so you don't do it. You can't, it's unnatural to sing that. Um, now, uh, now, that doesn't mean you can't have stress maximums in relatively, relatively strong positions. So California, here I come, right, is okay. And notice the third metrical position is stronger than the two on the adjacent sides. Seems to be okay, but stress maximum doesn't tell you about that that. It just tells you about the maximally weak positions. And then, now here's the negative example, um, which Kristen also mentioned, by the amazing light, or Alan, I guess, who initially came up with that. You don't want to sing it. Sounds bad. Okay. So stress maximum does some work in text setting. Again, you know, it doesn't do everything, but it does a lot. Um, okay, let's go on. Uh, what's another indication? 
Um, well, they all use the grid. All of these systems, and I'll take a step back, you know, since Halley and Kaiser, uh, Mark hit on the idea that possibly the, the sort of most natural uh, representation of these relevant phenomena is via the metrical grid. It gets applied to stress even, into the stress induction problem that we're, we were talking about, assignment problem, which we talked about before. It gets applied via Morris and Nigel to uh, uh, prosodic form, okay? And it also applies to musical form as well, quite naturally, as uh, Ray and Fred showed years ago, and here's uh, Mozart's 41st symphony represented in the grid notation. Now, what I just want to bracket here very quickly is that these grids are superficially quite similar. You know, you have the same columns there. Um, now, but look at the things on the bottom. Well, okay, one thing to note is you have lots of unoccupied positions, right? I mean, music, you simply have to have unoccupied grid positions. It's, conceptually necessary to describe anything resembling music that you have unoccupied positions. Well, do you need unoccupied positions to represent linguistic stress? I don't know, but I think the consensus is no, right? I mean, you know, but that's an argument for you. Uh, do you need unoccupied positions to represent uh, prosodic form? Well, Consensus is no, but again, that's your argument. That's not my argument. You certainly need them in music, and you, know, you simply can't make sense out of musical structure unless you include the notion of positions that are there, but that are not occupied by events, and on top of it, which can even have accent, okay? So in the Mozart case, you know, da 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 Right? So there's a position that is accented inherently, right? It has inherent accent whether it's occupied by an event or not, okay? I don't know if there's anything equivalent in linguistics, the notion of a position that has just a position. Well, in poetry, we'll get onto that, okay? okay but, you know, you, you, again, that's, this, is your, this is your argument. This is not mine. I'm just saying and it's, a, it's a necessary component of musical representation that you can have. Not only can you have positions that you need to represent that are, that are unoccupied, but on top of it, those positions can even be accented, okay? Meaning the unoc so this is the so-called metrical accent, the conceptually necessary component of, of musical representation. Um, okay, now let's look at one other difference that's relevant. So, there, so if you see there, I'm giving you a representation not just of the hierarchy, the locations uh, that seem to be relatively prominent of, uh, assigned to these notes, but also their constituency, and that's what the parentheses indicate. Now, um, there's a fair amount of controversy on how you best do this, but let's just say, you know, this, this is th that that. This constituency is a characteristic, or it's something. It's a. It's a, It's derived from the notes themselves. Unlike in the Halley Fab system above, right, where the grid itself, the construction of the grid, has inherent constituency. Okay. Whereas in the musical system, you don't want to say that the grid itself has inherent constituency. I don't have time to argue why that's the case, but let me just stipulate that it is and maybe we can talk about why it is later. So I'm just now pointing to the fact that yes, you have grid representations for all of these systems, but there are crucial differences, okay? And you have to, we have to take seriously those differences if we're gonna talk about making any kind of meaningful comparisons between these, these, these various domains. Okay, so uh, going on. Um, oh yeah, oh last thing I wanted to say. Now, lines in music are not real. There's no such thing as a musical line. Okay? And I can tell you that there's not, and I'll now show you that there's not. So take the representation up on the top of Mozart, okay? And now I'm going to take the first, what's represented on the, as the first line, and now on the bottom here, if you can see, is my cursor, oh yeah, cursor is reading. Okay, I'm just going to take the music that was here, and I'm now going to move it to the bottom. So it's now in a different line. Big deal. It's exactly the same thing. It's represented to the grid. It's related to the grid in exactly the same way as it is here. The difference, the only difference is um, that the relevant notion of constituency that's di dictated is what's indicated by the brackets 
by the parentheses. So I could either have it this way, ooh, sorry, uh, I guess I can't edit this, but I was, no, okay. The, if I moved this bottom unit up to the top, it would represent exactly the same music, no difference. And that's because the underlying grid structure is essentially this, okay? The grid is really a, it has no beginning and it's, it has no end. It's a circle. And so the locations, and so wherever you start, doesn't really matter. You're just going to go back, you're going to circle around to the beginning. And so what, the only reason why we represent it this way is just, it's easier to see. It's a notational convenience that we represent this as lines. But the lines aren't real. They're just an artifact of the notational system. So that's the last thing I was going to say. Um, okay, final, okay, now, final comparison uh, between text setting and uh, mo uh, 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 poetic metrical form. Um, in certain, in lots of metrical traditions, there are tunes that are associated very closely with the rhythm. Okay, here's one. I hope this works. Oh, I guess my sound files are not loading. Okay, well, I'll have to sing it to you. Um, this is uh, from Ashwini Deo's paper from a couple years ago on uh, Sanskrit metrics, and here's how it works. Now, this line, uh, which is uh, an instance of the line ratobadatta, which, sorry, I'm butchering the pronunciation, but is, exists in two forms, both as a pure prosodic form, which is to say that sequence of heavy and light syllables, right? But it also exists as the tune that's underneath it. And this is what I have here, which didn't unfortunately load, is Deo's recording, and it goes something like ya da 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 And so the way that that tune works is that each of the heavy syllables, there's a rule, gets assigned to metrical positions. Okay? And any text which is within this meter can, according to Deo, be assigned to that tune naturally, whereas a text from some other meter would not necessarily or probably would not naturally be assigned to this prosodic tune. Okay, this is a, not a metrical idiom many of us know very well, but there are idioms that we are very familiar with where this happens all the time. So here you go. If you look up in a hymnal, you'll see that there will be 384 tunes that will have the inscription next to them, CM, okay? It says CM in your hymnal. And what does CM mean? Well, it means common meter, okay? And this means that there are 384 tunes that will accept any text that is written within this meter, okay? Now, here are some of the tunes. God rest ye, merry gentlemen, may nothing you dismay. Here's another one. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, color amber waves of grain. And here's another one. Or all the acquaintance be forgotten and never come. Oh, these are all tunes. And now, how do you know that they're all that they all are instances of this form? Well, you can take one and you can substitute it in the other, and it will work, right? So you can go, uh, um, let's see, should all acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? Okay, what did I do? Should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? What did I do? Is anybody listening? <laughs> yeah, right. I substituted the old like sign into right into into America into, into God rest ye merry gentlemen, right? Or you know whatever you take my word for it. This explains, of course, the old joke that you know you can take any most Emily Dickinson poem and assign it to the Gilligan's Island theme. Who? I mean, this is generational, right? <laughs> You know, some of us know the Gilligan's Island theme, some of us don't, but those who do will know that you can know, you know, because I would not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me, you know, or, or no, let's see, how does the Gilligan's Island theme go? Uh, yeah, it's, it's like, that, that, yeah, right, 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 be kindly stop for me, his carriage, and immortality, okay, so it's a, you know, it's a funny joke, but the point is made, right, that this is a, that there's a class of prosodic tune, tunes which are, are very closely linked with this purely metrical form, which we're going to call common, common meter, okay, that, I mean, it's not controversial, but I think it needs to be said. Um, so, now, um, 
of course, but what this does for us is that we can therefore go the other way. Okay? So instead of defining the prosodic form as we did before as a sequence of syllables having certain characteristics, we can go the other way and we can say, oh, well, the, metric, the, the prosodic form is the sequence of syllables which can be assigned to this, which forms a natural relationship with, with, this, with, with these class of tunes. So, right, so in other words, this is now a text setting definition for what a metrical line is that's not reliant on the principles, I mean, which has a relationship to the principles of normal metrical form of the sort that Morris and Nigel are doing, but, it's a diff but, but, but you're going at it from the other way, okay? You're saying you're defining it in terms of a musical form. And if that's the case, but uh, then the metrical form problem just reduces to the text setting problem, okay? I mean, end of story. But of course, it's not the case. And I'm perfectly happy to uh, concede to, you know, not, not, not even a concession, but, uh, you know, Chris, uh, you know, Kristen and, and Nigel are absolutely right that there is something that's independent. There's a, there are principles of metrical form that are completely independent or largely independent of this kind of matching of a text to a tune that, you know, um, works in certain instances. And, okay, well, you know that has, that has to be the case. Um, so, for example, you know that has to be the case with the so-called pat, with, with, say, Psalm 137 as famously analyzed by Morris, right? So, it's the Temple of Jerusalem, right? <laughs> you know, according to, if you scan it right, it forms a picture of the temple. Right, that's what the scansion is. It makes a picture. But as Paul pointed out in his discussion of that, uh, uh, of Morris's article, uh, this is in Nigel's Linguistics of Writing book back, what is that, for 88, I think, as I recall? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, you might not want to consider those meters as normative or that they might, you, know, you might not want to put, include them within your theory of meter because as he says, the pattern is visual, which is just to say you can't hear the recitation, you can't hear those characteristics in a recitation, recitation. And there's a cryptographic element involved, as Paul says very nicely, I think, which is to say that for over 2,000 years until this paper was written, perhaps the only two people that had known about it were the psalmist himself and Morris Halley, right? They're the only people who knew what the meter was. And uh, so, so, which is, so, they're, so therefore you might want to say they are governed by constraints of their own and they should not be accounted for by the same theories of metrical verse. Okay, yeah, good. So, okay, I'm gonna just go on now. Of course, there are other metrical tune families. Um, here's one for iambic pentameter, but, right, and this is a Schubert song that actually uses exactly this uh, scansion. Uh, Unge, yeah, I'm sorry, Unge, thank you, Morris, yes. <laughs> this, is, this is my life. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, so, okay, now, yeah, if you'll, I mean, I don't have time to play it, uh, you'll see that exactly the rhythms that, are, that Schubert uses are the out-of-the-box rhythms from what we might call this iambic tune family. These have been studied by, incidentally, by Fain and Hallmark who looked at all of Schubert's iambic settings and found that they kind of clump into actually two different class of tunes. So it's a little more complicated than what I'm saying here is. But in any case, what you don't find when you use these iambic tune families is that the substitution effect works very well. So which is to say, if you take one of those tunes and you put in some, I don't know, Shakespeare sonnet or something like that, it will not sound natural, all right? The line, a given Shakespeare line has a very, uh, high probability of not making a natural match, unlike, say, the lines from Common Meter, which we saw before, which do are easily substituted. So, you, so there, so this, so the point here is that I think you want to insist on some principles of metricality that are unique to poetic metrical form. And then, but of course, there are also the text setting principles as well. And now the question is how do these interact? 
and there have been various ideas along these lines. Um, and you know, here they are. You know, these, these are just the same diagrams copied from previously. You have the poetic meter, and you have te text setting on, on the left. You have text setting on the right. Um, here is one idea of how they might work together, and this is from uh, well. Paul's uh, article from 2007, where he says composers construct a match between three tiers of linguistic structure, linguistic prominence, poetic meter, and musical rhythm. Uh, and then Francois and Mohammed's book from a few years ago, uh, you have a graphical representation of what's going on. And so you have the text on the top. Then notice you have the verse component here in the middle, okay? And then those go into the text setting. So, which means, Basically, what Paul is saying above that that the you need a, 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 met, a, a kind of a metrical for at least I'm taking it as a parsing as a metrical parsing of the text prior to the text setting constraints. Okay, it, and then it, they go into that. Then the melody goes in on one side. The the uh, text you get an output, and if you get an output, it's 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 a sung verse. I'm going to propose a slightly different organization of the material, and here it is. Okay, so here, what if you what you, this diagram is just the two diagrams that you had before, but they're combined on top of one one another. Okay, so on top you have metrical form, you have poetic metrical form, and underneath you have text setting. So what this allows you to do is it gives you a lot of paths from the sequence of syllables down to the text setting. So one possibility is that you take, the, you start with your syllabic sequence, you parse it for metrical form. If you get a metrical line, then then that gets fed into your text setting with and combined with the sequence of notes. And if you get an output, you get a text setting. Okay, but notice there's also this possibility, which is you can completely bypass this part, which is to say. It doesn't need to go through the abstract metrical form comparison mechanism. You just go straight past it. And what that means is you have a prose text. And you get prose. I mean, right? I mean, lots of songs have prose texts. Do everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, you know, right? Ecclesiastes, a prose text by Pete Seeger. You know, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union, right? You know, right? That's from what schoolhouse rock. So you know, pro or Handel's Messiah. You know, lots of prose texts are perfectly viable texts. There's no requirement the texts be metrical. That's kind of obvious, and any sensible theory of meter has to allow for that possibility. Okay, and so here's what. So, and then. Now, there are more options that are available to you, but maybe we'll just go through that. What I just said is that, right? So here you go directly from the syllable sequence, and then you combine it with a note sequence, and then there's no output from the metrical generator, okay? So you don't even use that, and so you get your text setting on the bottom. Now, notice what I'm saying is that this is a text initial set. Now, here's another option. You either have text initial settings or you have tune initial settings. This is just kind of a matter of logic, which is your composer, you can have choice. You can start with one of two things. You can start with your tune or you can start with your text, right? So in this case, I'm proposing that you have your text over here. And then this dotted line around here indicates that it's the notes that you have to compose, right? So that's the work that you're doing as a composer. You're creating this little, you know, this, this oval with the data dot, with the, with the dashed lines around it. You know, this is the composer's job over here, okay? But now there's also the possibility that you have a tune, you, you have your tune to start out with, okay? But now the text is metrical. Um, sorry, you have, the, to, you have the, to the text to start out with. Oh, this is wrong. I'm sorry, I should have said text initial. Metrical text, that's wrong, sorry. It should text initial mediated path, okay? So that means what you have is you have a metrical text and then now you're composing a note sequence that corresponds to the metrical text. That's easier, <laughs> right? For reasons that we talked about before, which is that you have this, or at least for certain kinds of texts, there are, you, there are these prosodic tune families which limit pretty drastically the rhythmic possibilities that you're gonna that you're gonna have available to you and that's what you want as a composer you want to limit your options you don't want to do too much work right you want to choose from you know a small number of options rather than lots of them okay so 
I mean, Bruce, I remember, once emailed me, says, yeah, well, that's why you want, you know, a metrical text, because it's easier, and he's right, okay? And this explains why it's right. But now, okay, now let's go over to, um, uh, 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 oh, gosh, this is wrong. Yeah, uh, okay, this is, I should, this should say tune initial. So now, now you have two possibilities for your tune initial, which is you can have a non-prosodic tune, right, which is ones, now notice, this is not a metrical text. This is a tune that you have that, does, that has the kind of characteristics of the sort that would accompany, say, common meter, okay? And so then that's easy. So you got your tune, and then you have a syllabic sequence, and then you make a comparison, right? You comp and if the comparison works, then that's your text setting, and you get an output. But now notice what happens with this. That when you do this, if you compose the um, uh, um, tune first, uh, if, if sorry, if you have one of the prosodic tunes and you use a tune initial text setting, okay, and you and then you 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 create a text, you're going to get a metrical line for free, and that's what this shows. Okay, so in other, this is what I said before. If you align the the syllables and the uh, the the positions appropriately, okay, uh, here, the output of the metrical evaluator will be positive, and you're going to get a metrical tune. You're going to get a metrical form, whether you were intending to or not. Yeah, you will get to, you you will be writing a metrical form, just by virtue of choosing a prosodic tune type and assigning it assigning the, 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 uh, the, the syllables to it uh, uh, appropriately. Okay, well, there's one. So I guess, how am I doing for time? Okay, so um, uh, let's see. I guess there's one other. Oh, yeah, there's, there's one other option here, which, is, I, uh, which, which needs to be explored, which is that you can have um, non-prosodic tunes, and you can have... Um, uh, Right, if you have a, a non-prosodic tune, um, sorry, you can have a prosodic tune, yeah, but um, uh, you can have a, oh yeah, it will not necessarily be, so you, have, you can have many tunes which will not meet with, it, which, which will not correspond to any given metrical form. So to take an example, um, uh, there are numerous text settings that are possible um, over here, like within non-prosodic tunes, which will meet, which will form a perfectly viable um, relationship with a um, even a relatively simple melody, but they won't be metrical, right? Right. So you'll have lots of songs which will be in no way metrical. And here's an example: "I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas." Right? What's the meter? I mean, it's the white Christmas meter, right? It's the, you know, that's, that's it, you know. Um, now, it's a kind of interesting fact, I think, that um, one of the reasons that that's possible for us is that, I think, is that, you know, we have a system of musical notation which allows us to represent musical rhythm. Uh, back here... Uh, they did not. They, or there is no extant theory. I mean, there are various sort of ad hoc systems of representing uh, Indian rhythms. But what the poetic meter does for you here is it does exactly the same job that our musical notation system does, which is it tells you what the durations are. Right? It meets that. It does that job. It says when you have a syllable, uh, when you have a syllable of this type make it long. If it's this type, you make it short. And so therefore you have this extremely robust type of metrical forms which are allowed, which there, therefore dictate, very, can dictate rather elaborate strings of notes, uh, rhythmic patterns, doing the job of rhythmic notation. And it's my impression that as you get systems, as you get more robust systems of musical notation, the metrical forms, at least the not the complexity of the metrical forms, but let's say the uh, taxonomy of them tends to be somewhat somewhat limited. So essentially, we're down to four, and that's really all we need. <laughs>
because we have our own system of musical notation, which can tell you exactly what's, what's going on here. Okay, so I guess I'm ready to conclude. Um, the uh, conclusion is, well, no, the text setting pro pro problem does not reduce to the poetic f form problem in all cases, granted. I, you know, there's no question about that. But in some instances it does, um, which is to say composing a metrical line reduces to producing sy syllabic sequences which correspond appropriately to, exist to an existing tune. If that's the case, then understanding what meter does may require, I should say, understanding the principles of correspondence that are applicable to text setting. So you get the text setting principles, you'll get a lot of meter for free. And that's kind of the bottom line. Okay. So John, I've got, I've got a question about memory. Um, about what? Memory. So, uh, so there, I mean, there are some, it, take Greek lyric meter, right? So Greek lyric meter, you have a whole strophe that's got a particular rhythmic pattern and you repeat exactly the same rhythmic pattern again in the antistrophe. So something's holding that in memory. I guess one of the arguments that's been made is that it's set to music and that music helps you remember. I'm also thinking about the classical Sanskrit examples. Well, you know, these are pretty complex sequences. The question really is whether setting it to music aids with these very complex um, uh, meters to remember them. I mean, they're, they're, they're very they're kind of irrational, these meters, at some level. Um, my intuitive sense is that it does. I mean, I, I can remember the tune now. That's the Rato Bata tune. So now, whereas I'm not sure if I would, well, certainly I have no idea what the sequence of H and L's are, if you ask me, right? <laughs> In other words, I mean, I could figure it out based on my recollection of the tune, but I can't remember what the actual H, H and L's are. So I think yes, absolutely. Now the question is whether assigning the pitches to them helps. And my sense is yes, in addition, yeah, it does. It, 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 so if it were just purely, right, I would probably be much less likely to be able to remember it than if there were not those particular pitches that were attached to it. Now I don't actually, as a matter of fact, I don't really know whether there is as robust a class of as of robotata tunes in Sanskrit as there are, say, for common meter in English, right? There, as I showed you, I gave you, you know, seven, but there are 384 common meter tunes. So there are a whole bunch of tunes then which will allow you to remember the meter in English, whereas it may be the case in, in I mean, maybe other people know that in Sanskrit metrics, you're limited to a, a smaller actual cl class of pitches, right? Because you, know, you can fill the metrical slots by lots of pitches, but it may be the case that they just choose to minimize the number of pitches. You know, that when you're, you learn a meter, you're not just learning a rhythmic sequence, you're learning actual notes that are associated to that as well. I should have an answer to that question, but I don't. about the Sanskrit meters, they're actually, as uh, Ashwini Deo shows, um, basically four more uh, feet with the um, different distribution of uh, syllable structures. You can realize it as light, heavy, light, or as heavy, light, light, and that's essentially the site of variation. And in fact, this is a generative system because you can make up meters. Uh, the ones that she treats, you know, the, that she has tunes for are maybe the two dozen uh, most popular ones. And um, there's actually um, ones that are like hapax meters that you can make up that show up, you know, because people, people sort of play with this system. So it's actually a productive uh, system. And um, really the invariant lies at this form or a um, foot structure. Is, I mean, the way to think of it is as if um, we took all the different versions of iambic pentameter, you know, uh, you know, then are dreamt of in your philosophy or whatever, and reified them as in uh, separate meters and just insisted that all the lines of a poem have to follow exactly that pattern. 
then we'd also have hundreds and hundreds of meters in our repertoire. Yeah, the, there are certainly, uh, whereas, so the question is, why do we not have hundreds and hundreds of meters in our repertoire, right? I mean, any answers to that question? Or wh why do they have hundreds of meters, and why, why do we only, why do we have essentially four, but lots of variants of those four? Yeah. Um, the story that I gave, which I, you know, I agree is certainly, you know, uh, controversial at best, is that we have other mechanisms by which we can represent rhythmic structure in music. They don't. We're the only one, right? We're the only system which allows us to represent musical structure on the page. And so there's a, uh, uh, whereas, and if you don't have that, you need some other mechanism of doing it. And the meter does that job in lots of traditions. That's now, you don't have to buy that. That's my, that, that's, you know, argue with me as Morris always says. <laughs> I had a question about, uh, you mentioned the fact that one can sing prose text, text which have no, nobody would, would argue they have uh, metrical structure. Now, uh, one thing that has been left off uh, out of this discussion con constantly is parallelism. Now, it's, uh, and I don't know to what extent what, what I've noticed is, is general. I've noticed that many prose texts, when they are set to music, there is a lot of repetition involved because really what is set to music, the, it's the text, but then you have to repeat pieces of it the music has a lot, usually a lot of parallelism in it, and the only way you can accommodate that, you can make this prose text congruent with the music, is by repeating pieces of it. And so uh, I was wondering whether when you talked about prosodic tunes, you were men actually meaning music that has that kind of structure with a lot of repetition of motives. Is that what you meant? Yeah, I mean strophic forms, and I mean them in exactly the sense uh, now, uh, as the drunken sailor tune, okay? So okay. in other words, when, right, so you have positions, uh, right, which are available for occupancy. Yes. Or, del or deletion. Okay. But the, right? And so what the tune family makes available is a kind of a skeleton. Yeah. yeah. And then there are these additional positions which are, which are considered acceptable variants. Now, the ultimate effect will be some level of parallelism and in some cases identity, okay. but in many cases pretty significant departures. Okay. So that's the difference between da 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 and da 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 da. Now, do you want to call those parallel? Well, yeah, but they're not identical, right? So the kind of parallelism that you get is parallelism that's defined by this you know, similarity metric that I'm advancing here. Okay, so that will bring for, any, the question is, uh, is a question for anybody who is doing metrics anyway. We want to have also a theory of parallelism in the linguistic material, because whenever you put linguistic material to music that has parallelism, uh, what I've seen is you, Get, you have to have a lot of linguistic parallelism, uh, rather parallelism in the linguistic material. Okay. Yeah, but I mean now then the interesting question is why is what you know put him in the scuppers with a, a, a hosepipe on him a viable quote unquote line, as well as keel haul him till he's sober, right? One with eleven syllables and one with seven. Yeah, that has to okay. do with it. Right, that's, I mean, both of these are acceptable texts within this tune, and your notion of parallelism has to be robust enough to accommodate both, right? Okay. If, you're, if we're gonna push the analogy between text setting and, and poetic form. Okay. But as I say, you know, we can't push that analogy too, too far, too hard, I think. Uh, in your diagram with boxes and ovals, you, you put forth a, a kind of dual root theory of text setting, and, uh, which struck me as intuitively very appealing. And I, I wanted to run a phenomenon by you and see if you think this might be an instance of, of what you've been talking about. 
Uh, the phenomenon is what happens when you have a poetic line that begins with an inversion. So da -da, like in pentameter, da 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 da. Uh, I know of two ways that this is handled. Uh, I believe in most English hymn tunes, uh, the way you do it is to just, uh, right, you'll, you'll see multiple stanzas in the, uh, the, the same hymn, and they establish a regular setting of the notes of the, of the positions of the meter to the notes of the tune. And then finally, maybe in the third stanza, you hit an inversion. Uh, people will sing it just riding roughshod over the stress. So da 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 over the blah blah blah, yeah, or yeah. fear lest I'd launch away. Uh, and they feel plenty to sing, but the people get used to it. So that's one way. The other way occurs in your Schubert song, where uh, there are five lines of iambic pentameter, and they all have the rhythm da 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 and then you get to the last one, which has an inversion. Dein ist mein Herz und so. And so, of course, the musical setting yeah. suddenly stops being iambic. It takes that inversion, and it puts the stress syllable right on the beat, which is, of course, exceedingly appropriate to what it's saying. Uh, so I would, if I'm catching on to what you're saying, the hymn case is like your light blue channel. Uh, where, it's, where the setting is going via the meter, uh, much as, as Paul would say, I guess. And the Schubert case is the short circuiting uh, case where you go straight from the, you're not looking at your, your box. No, I, I can see you're, it here. I, yeah, yeah, I can okay. see it, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. So the, the, uh, the hymns go through yeah, the yeah. pale blue uh, items, yeah, and, yeah. and Schubert is yeah. taking the green to yellow. It, it, it's for the last, often. well, for the, no, for the last stance, for the last line. That's the what he yes, does. exactly. Right, for the, so, so he, he, he moves, right? He starts, Schubert starts over here, and then for the last line, he goes over there. He bypasses the meter, does, right? Does he need to go with the blue for the first five lines? Because they don't have any inversions in them. The, I, th I think both, no, both no, methods but, would yield the same well, result. Hang on, let me see if we can nail this down. So, so OK, yeah. we agree that we, in Schubert's case, it's, it's text first, right? It's not tune first. And yeah. as he has the text, it's an existing text. Yeah. OK, so his job is to go over here. He's got to write some, he's got to write some, he's got to write some notes that correspond to the text. Yeah. Now. There are two ways that he can go. He can, either, uh, he can either respond to the metrical form in some way, right? Or he can completely, even if it's written within a metrical form, he can completely ignore it, yeah. right? I, you know, he can treat it as prose. And my sense, or I guess he could take elements of both. He could take, you know, the first five syllables out of the box, and then he could depart from it at, at the end, okay. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, I, I don't. Th I, th I think it's. Um, I wouldn't insist that he. You, you, that, 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 that that one or the other is necessarily dictates Schubert's oh, practice so consistently. I, I was going by genre, but you imagine that there's actually a lever, <laughs> that uh, you can switch at any given moment of composition. Yeah, I mean, I suppose right. But you know, there the, the there is. Tons and tons of music which just goes through the blue, right? Yep. Which just sets meter exactly in the rhythms that, that come out of the metrical box. And it's not necessarily boring music either, right? right? I mean, there's really, you know, uh, you know, there's probably no, uh, you know, Schubert was not good as favorite composer. You know, he had his two house composers, right? Uh, Reichardt and who's the other one? I can't remember. You know, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 Schubert famously had his music returned to, uh, to, to his Goethe settings returned to him, uh, uncommented on by Goethe, and that was one of con a great slight in his, in his life. But he had two composers that would set his music in the way that he regarded as appropriate, and they were extremely simple settings, which is to say very much through the blue. Through the blue. Yeah, yeah. That's cool, right. thank you. Yeah. Can you give a follow-up to the blues? Because we looked at this very question, actually. 
So Matt Wynn and I have a paper in um, linguistics and literature on this question of inversions. And so we looked at uh, actually sort of a case almost exactly like this. So if music be the food of love, play on, play on, play on, right? Which way the text is already pre-existing and then the music was written to it. The next stanza is pleasures invade, right? And it's done not like the hymn way that you're suggesting. It's done so that pleasures is, is sung like correctly, musically, so that the, the stressed syllable is on the stressed beat. And, you know, so then we said, okay, well then, you know, if you're going to sort of say that the abstract metrical form is going to be retained in this case, then you have to have a different theory of how stress maxima work, right? In fact, that you've got to reparse this as an empty position, right, plus then, uh, you know, a triplet, right? And you, like, this whole thing is very much reminiscent of a, um, an exchange we had at Morris's cottage once upon a time, but you had a case where um, you had, a, I thought, a pretty good argument for uh, empty positions in the poetry from the recitation of limericks, right, where, you know, at the end, I mean, they're printed out as if they're five lines, but they're really four lines, but you have to rest at the end of the first and second lines. Yeah, I mean, I would, well, if you want to deal with empty positions, I, I don't see how you get around well, catalexis or limericks without representing empty positions. Now, the question is, how much work do you want them to do in your theory? But on this question of inversion, I should say, I think Bruce is right. You have this option of either going or maintaining the meter and accepting a, a mismatch, or you change the tune. And in fact, you know that. So you, there are examples. I think some experimental examples of this. So you take the song, Frere Jaca, and then you put the line to it, my brother's dog keeps on barking, okay? So, okay, so that which would give you a mismatch, right? You, my brother's dog keeps on barking. And you ask people, what do people do? And I think what people do is they, they do this. They go, my, uh, my brother's, uh, um, they, don't do, they don't do my brother's dog. They go, my brother's dog keeps on barking. So they add a syllable to the left. Right? So then you would want to represent a left position there as a plus, okay? And then they make one of the, and then they make brothers melismatic, right? Bro, my, brother, my brother's dog keeps on barking. So they distort the tune in order to deal with the mismatch. Now, but I agree, there probably are a lot, there are many cases when the metrical form is just so insistent that you're going to be willing to accept the mismatch and not alter the tune, right? Conserv I mean, you accept a more conservative kind of rendition. Okay, thanks.